Good evening. I'm John Miko, the Executive Director of the Union League Legacy Foundation. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to this uh, public affairs program. The Legacy Foundation is the nonprofit charity of the Union League of Philadelphia. Guided by the United States Constitution, the values and the spirit of the Union League of Philadelphia, the Legacy Foundation's goal is to create more involved, better educated citizen leaders. We do this through a host of programs, including citizenship programs for young uh, future leaders, scholarships to uh, good citizens. Uh, we do this through programs like tonight's public affairs program, publications, exhibits, and through the care of one of the great Civil War collections uh, in the United States. All of this is made possible through the voluntary contributions of members and others who share our values and want to share them with the Philadelphia region and beyond. And all of this uh, we appreciate very much. And especially I want to thank our Founders Circle and Lincoln leaders uh, who really support us and make all of this possible. So before I uh, introduce um, the chair of the program committee, just a, a one little housekeeping item. Uh, we will be taking questions uh, throughout the program. Actually, we'll probably take them at the end. And for those of you who are watching on Zoom, you can use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen, bottom middle of your screen to ask questions at any time. Uh, and hopefully we'll get to as many of, as possible towards the end of the program. And now it's my pleasure to introduce to you the chair of the program committee for the Legacy Foundation, Mr. Steve Target. Steve. Well, John, thank you. And on behalf of all of our Union League membership, we all thank you and Kira and your Legacy Foundation colleagues for your really your continued hard work and support to bring us programming like this evening until we can gather together, hopefully in person. And I believe that golf may have been the first professional sport since COVID that actually ventured into competition this year. But now with the start of a new baseball season, professional lacrosse, NBA and NHL, hopefully attempting to conclude their seasons, and with NFL, college, high school sports, and even youth sports right around the corner, we hope, we thought that a program on sports and COVID would be an important topic for all of us to uh, engage in. Tonight, we have an excellent panel of, of folks to talk to us about this topic. And leading the discussion is Mr. Harry Donahue. Mr. Donahue, as many of you know, is the host of Inside Golf. You may know him or recognize his voice as the voice of Temple Sports. Or perhaps you know him because you've seen him actually golfing at Torsdale or Union League National. So at this time, I'm pleased and honored to introduce the moderator for this evening's program, Union League member, Harry Donahue. Harry. Steve, thanks very much. John, thank you very much as well for putting together our discussion tonight on the outlook for sports amid COVID-19, something that's never happened like this on such a big scale. And it has affected every aspect of society. And tonight we're gonna to talk about one aspect of society albeit a rather important one for a lot of people, namely college and professional sports. And we're gonna kind of gear it to the Philadelphia area, but at times we'll probably uh, get beyond that footprint as well. Our panel tonight, three members of our panel tonight, one of them is a longtime team physician for the Philadelphia Flyers. He also served several years as a team physician with the Philadelphia Eagles. From uh, Pennsylvania Hospital, Dr. Gary Dersheimer. Dr. Dersheimer, Gary, thanks very much for joining us tonight. My pleasure. Also tonight, former Major League pitcher, back threw a no-hitter when he was with the Phillies, one of three teams that he pitched for. In addition to the Phillies, the Atlanta Braves and Houston Astros. Currently a Major League Baseball television analyst, no stranger to Phillies and sports in the Philadelphia area, Tommy Green. Tommy, how you doing, guys? You Thanks for having. Me. Thanks for having me. And our third panelist tonight is Fran Dumpy, who for 17 years was the head basketball coach at the University of Pennsylvania, then 13 years as the head basketball coach at Temple University, and he thought he was going to get out and live retirement to the end, but uh, a few weeks ago. He graciously accepted the offer to become the interim athletic director of Temple University. And Fran, this certainly has been a baptism of fire for you, I know. 
It's been a little different, Howard, to be honest with you, but thanks for having me on. Thanks for thinking of me and uh, happy to be with you guys. Glad you could join us and bring your expertise, both dual capacity as a coach and now as an athletic administrator. Uh, Dr. Thurshammer is going to be uh, with us for only about 30 minutes or so because he is, he's virtual, of course, in our hookup here on Zoom tonight, but he's in Toronto, Canada with the rest of the Flyers team and traveling party. He's going to spend a lot of time in that city over the next few weeks because the NHL's model has the teams playing in two cities, Edmonton and Toronto. The Flyers right now getting ready to open the season this weekend in Toronto. And doctor, I thought we'd, we'd open up uh, the, the questions to you in terms of what do you see from your vantage point, a physician, as being the best model program, say among Major League Baseball, which has already had a, a hurdle to climb, a big one with the Miami Marlins here in the past 48 hours, testing positive with several players and coaches, uh, or the NBA, which hasn't tipped off its season yet, the WNBA. As Steve mentioned, golf's been pretty lucky, I guess, in some regards. Uh, they've been around now for a month and a half with tournaments in several cities, and the number of positive cases on the PGA Tour have been minimal. College athletics are getting started. We'll talk to Fran, of course, a lot about that. But is there a model you see out there, Gary, that maybe has one up on other models and a better chance of maybe seeing fewer cases and having their seasons or schedules fulfilled? I think it all boils down to the real basics. I have my mask here that'll be on every time I'm out of my hotel room. Um, we have hand sanitizer everywhere and we're distancing from each other at least until we pass the seven day quarantine mark, so to speak. And uh, with all the other teams, the NBA and the NHL have had a little easier that we're only finishing the season and the playoffs so they can go into this bubble which is like a quarantine that you would have if you had the disease or you're expected of having the disease and we're going to be very isolated uh, not only to protect ourselves but we're protecting the citizens of where we've been lucky enough to travel. Gary how frequently are the flyers tested? Uh, while we're here, we're being tested every day. Certainly that's going to last a minimum of seven to 14 days. If all the testing turns out to be satisfactory, maybe it'll go to a little less testing. Uh, but we were tested during the time that we were in Philadelphia for a month on a voluntary camp and then two weeks on uh, a, a mandatory camp. And I think that was also helpful if there were any people that were out in the community uh, that we kind of got the infections over with at that point. I know you can't tell us in terms of actual numbers of any positive cases, uh, but the protocol, what would it be if a player or a coach, anybody in the travel party test positive? Well, if the test is positive first, is it a true positive or false positive? So if someone had typical symptoms, they tested positive on the screening test, they would still get a confirmatory nasopharyngeal swab. If that came back positive, they had symptoms, they're positive, then you're quarantined for uh, 10 days and at least three days past your last serious symptoms. If that uh, first test screening test was positive, but you had no symptoms, you seemed healthy, then we would do at least one and usually two confirmatory nasopharyngeal swab tests. If they came back negative, uh, then most would consider you to be negative since that's the gold standard test and provided you still had no symptoms, then you could be returned to the, to the group. But otherwise, everybody's quarantined with the first positive test. Gary, has everybody got their own room and they're not sharing rooms at, at all? Correct. We all have our own room. Okay. How, how about things like, like I know you're going to be leaving here uh, shortly to go with the team. Uh, I don't know if it's a dinner function or uh, 
just explain to us the logistics, a typical day, meals, for instance. Are there, is there social distancing around the tables? Yes, they have three people to the table, and that may change again once we've been here for seven or more days. Uh, all the hotel staff that are anywhere near the players, they've been tested. The only servers are behind plexiglass. Uh, there's minimal interaction. There's minimal interaction with anybody in this hotel. Um, we, the bus drivers, they're screened. Um, they're cordoned off uh, on the bus. The people at the hockey arenas are screened that are gonna be anywhere close to the players. And uh, really there's no interaction, but the closest interaction might be on the ice with a referee. And once again, we look for exposures greater than five to 10 minutes within six feet of each other. So uh, this has been a sport that's been conducive to not having that close interaction for any long period of time. And they did have a game last night. How did everything go? Was it normal from your standpoint in terms of once the puck was dropped? Oh, yes. Yeah, everything else goes out of their minds. There weren't any crowd noises to, uh, to affect them at all. And uh, you certainly heard the scratch of the skates on the ice and the slap of the sticks. Uh, and uh, especially our head coach, he's a, a guy that's yelling out commands and things. And it's, it's great to be able to hear him. Fran, let's bring you on here to talk a little bit about in your role as athletic director now overseeing uh, the sports that will be started or already have started in the case of football practice on the Temple campus for the fall and hopefully get through a full schedule. Um, what's your biggest concern for these student athletes, your, your football players that are on campus now and practice? Well, certainly their health and safety here. Uh, I don't think anybody's questioning that whatsoever. The, the, all of university life is, is, a, is a concern as well in that without those students, without, without the student athletes, there's not a lot, uh, not, a re, not a reason for all of us to, to be in college world. Uh, we need them. We need them healthy and safe. And uh, now we're worried about whether or not we can have live classes. Most of us will probably be online still virtually in the fall semester and hopefully we'll get some uh, go ahead that we can have a lot of in-person classes in the second semester, but most of it will be online. So all of these things are, are a concern. I worry about the, the high school seniors. I worry about the college seniors and that rite of passage that you have to, to enjoy your last year in school. And, uh, and it's really kind of an unfair uh, situation for them. We've all been had the, those opportunities and these young people don't have the same chance of, of uh, living a, a living that that same way uh, because of the the coronavirus and what it's done to all of us and corona's uh, really running the show at this point it's it dominating all of our lives at this point right um, college football programs have already been impacted uh, not necessarily at the uh, division 1a or level but uh, certainly other schools conferences, uh, they've canceled their seasons. Um, it, it's had a major, major impact already. What, how frequently are, are your football players, for instance, tested right now uh, on the Temple campus during these early preseason workouts? Well, they're all tested once a week. Uh, once the season gets started, how, if and indeed it happens, uh, they're going to be tested 70, 72 hours before kickoff. And uh, that will be the whether or not you can get on the plane will be told because that you'll hopefully get that test result back in a day or or 36 hours or so. And uh, then you'll be able to, to decide who can even make the trips if you're going away. And uh, but that 72 hours is pretty much a given for all of the uh, NCAA schools at this point, certainly with ours. The most of these the. Power of five conferences, now three, ACC just decided what they're going to do today, but the Big Ten and the Pac-12 came out and said they're going to play 10 conference games. The ACC today said they're going to play 10 conference games plus one. Uh, so some of that affects uh, the, the others. Some of it affects Temple University football as well. Uh, so there's still, uh, we're all still a work in progress trying to make the best decisions as possible and take as many uh, 
of the uh, certainly the first priority is what the health and safety of those student athletes are and the students themselves. So who knows if we're going to have uh, attendance at all of these games or can the attendance happen gradually? You're going to open it with maybe five or 6,000 people and then will it get better and will, will the, uh, the doctors allow us to, to go further and, and have more people in the stands? So all of these things are still questions that are absolutely unanswerable today. Right. And it's a moving target as we go on day to day, hour to hour, really. Something could pop up that changes everything. Uh, getting back to your scheduling, uh, normally you would play eight conference games and four non-conference games, including one game against the uh, University of Miami, a member of the ACC, which you just said, announced today, that Miami will only be playing one non-conference opponent. Uh, how soon do you think you'll find out if you're going to be that opponent? <laughs> well, along with that, they also announced that they're not going to be able to start their season before September 7th. And our game is scheduled for September 5th. So uh, is that, a, is that a pretty good indicator? <laughs> that's a pretty good indicator. I think. Okay. And that was, that was to be played in Miami. Yeah. Um, you've already lost another game. Uh, a Big Ten opponent, Rutgers. Mm -hmm. A lot of people I know are looking forward to the resumption of the series between Temple and Rutgers, and they were both members of the Big East. And uh, that game has been canceled this year. So ostensibly, you're down two games already, and here we are still a month out in the regular season. Your other game is against two other games against a well, home game against Idaho, I believe, and uh, UMass on the road. Yes, um, the conference... I'm talking about the American Athletic, of which Temporal is a member. So far, hasn't come out and said, okay, our schools are only going to play eight conference games or maybe add one nine and only one non-conference, right? Nothing yet from uh, the commissioner and uh, the staff of the American Athletic Conference on that? We've had a lot of discussions. Uh, we're really, the, the thought was to wait for the Power Five conferences to announce all that they're doing. Obviously, we're waiting on the Big 12 and the SEC to see what they will do. Uh, so it's still a lot of wait and see kind of, kind of approach. And so, but it, it could be 10 games that we would play in a conference schedule, or it could be eight and two conference and non-conference. Uh, so there's still a lot to be determined in terms of uh, how the season will actually go. And hopefully it will go. Hopefully is uh, definitely, I think, everybody's key word. Tommy Green, let's talk about you as a former player. Yeah. If you were faced, Tommy, with uh, a situation like your uh, contemporaries are faced with now, some of them have opted out of playing for different reasons. Uh, how would you have approached it? What would have been some of your biggest concerns, Tommy, if you were still an active player? Well, if, if I was still at, uh, and today, obviously, I'd made a little bit more money than I made before um i would have to think um how you know me physically am i more susceptible to getting in and how it affects people like that me being a type 2 diabetic uh, as we discussed um i mean i know i would look at it in a way that uh i put my family first and if i'm in a situation where monetarily i i don't need to do it I'm not going to put my family in that situation or me in that situation. So I would probably opt out. That would be my first thought. Tommy, have you talked to any current either members of the Phillies or other Major League Baseball players about the decisions they have to make and this whole experience of what's going on? I wish I wish I could have more, but they've been pretty much, uh, uh, I mean, they've done the right thing, trying to quarantine their self the best they can just so they can play their season. Personally, I haven't had any discussions with any of the team members or, or coaches or anything like that, uh, uh, barring what you see on TV my, uh, that you see by interviews they do doing by Zoom or, or that the reporters are, are giving out. Uh, and then that's what I'm hearing, uh, too, with some, some of the contacts I have is that they're doing everything possible. And as you can see by what happened this past week, you know, it still happens, you know, I mean, because those teams, Major League Baseball teams, they are traveling. 
they're they're leaving that bubble they were started in and and heading out to places and and it's hard it's going to be hard to i think to to control all things all the time so we'll see it's going to be a big if in my question yeah uh gary get back to you because i know you're you're going to leave us uh, in a couple minutes um you know the baseball model is so different than the NBA and the and the NHL model in terms of uh, the players' ability to to move around uh, as they travel and they're traveling. Whereas the NBA, NHL, WNBA, they're all basically in these bubbles. I don't know how baseball could have done it any differently. Do you? I mean, have you talked to any Major League Baseball physicians, uh, your your peers, contemporaries? that are hooked up with baseball teams uh, and are they disappointed maybe that that model doesn't more closely resemble the model of the NHL? I've heard uh, from some of the physicians on uh, some of the basics of their models and, you know, it really boils down to how well you can isolate yourself on a trip. Um, at least we're here for a short time of the playoffs. It'll be a different story if when the NHL would start the next season. Um, can you continue this kind of a model with travel where once the players are home, they are only home. Once they're on a charter jet to a bus, to a hotel, to a rink, can they stick to that? And that's uh, somewhat easy for this defined period of time of maximum of two and a half months. It's a lot harder when it's a six month season. And uh, that's where uh, this model just becomes a lot easier. And we've seen how contagious this disease is. And as Tommy said, what uh, a lot of the players had talked about was protecting their family, players that have pregnant wives, players that just had babies, coaches that are older that have some underlying uh, diseases. And I think they've been relatively comfortable in this model because of all the testing and they know they're going to be as isolated as isolated can be. Yeah. And, and we're just at the beginning of it, Gary, right? This, the season, yes. if you go to the Stanley cup goes what into through September. Yeah. At least till the end of September, maybe the first day or two of October. That's but a long at least time. It's a finite amount. Yeah. As opposed to a six month season uh, going into the postseason and things, that's a lot harder pill to swallow to stay isolated. I agree with that. I mean, uh, that's, that's the big point right there. Is these guys can do it for a short period of time. That's that's going to be a great thing they can get through. But the longer it goes, I mean, us being human beings get stir crazy. and want to, I mean, it's hard to do something like that. We're really in uncharted territory right there with what we got to do. And and I'm hoping we can pull it off to give to give the world, give our country to, and, and and our sports people the, uh, the sports they want to see, the because it has been so, it's been something that's hit our country so hard, and and they need a ray of sunshine, and then and that's the way I look at it. So I'm hoping we can think about it like that as athletes, which make may might make us make the right decisions not to do something that might jeopardize that. Right. And that's that's the huge thing. That's a huge thing as an athlete. Gary, I know you have to go. Um, enjoy the rest of your night. Be safe. And uh, the season begins uh, this weekend for the Flyers. The regular yes. season. They already won to know. They won their exhibition game last for, year. For the scrimmage game. And now we play for the seeding. Um, and we're certainly guaranteed to get into the first round of the Stanley Cup playoffs. And uh, we'll be looking forward to hearing everybody rooting from us from your Zoom and uh, TV. Thank you so Absolutely. much for having me with you. Before you go, you're going to be, uh, if you folks stay in Toronto, the Flyers and they don't go to Edmonton. Uh, the last two rounds of the Stanley Cup playoffs, the semifinals and the finals are planned now for Edmonton. So if we get through these uh, first two rounds and we would be one of the four teams going to Edmonton. So I'm hoping to get back there. When I first started with the Flyers in the 80s, I went to Edmonton twice playing the best team in the world. If you think about all the players that run that team and I'd like to go there and win one there. That'd be great. Looking Wait, forward to you seeing the champagne on the beer. You won't? <laughs> yeah. yeah, keep the beer. You won't have number 99 to worry about this trip. Exactly. Connor McDavid's a Gary, little Gary, thanks very much. He's good. Thank you so much. 
Have a good night, all. And a good night to you and, and to the rest of the Flyers. That's Dr. Gary Dersheimer. He had a previous engagement with the Flyers, so he's going to cut out from our little panel discussion. Fran, let's get back to you and talk about the, uh, the football program, because I know you have other fall sports that are get, not yet up and active, but the football program is. And, you know, we talked about models. And I guess you can control, or how much control does uh, the athletic department, the coaching staff have over players, student athlete, football players, when they're not on the practice field now, this time of the year, when they're practicing, I think they're about 20 hours of actual on the field practice, plus some lifting uh, and, and training, that, that sort of thing. But when they're on their own time, uh, how do you monitor, do you monitor? Well, you're gonna need to counsel with them always, uh, but you're gonna have to trust them as well that they're gonna do the right things. And there was a, one of the coaches, may have been a uh, strength and conditioning coach at Temple as he was working with uh, the young guys said, just give us a chance to play, uh, do everything the right way, do, do your work on the field here. But then when you go home, uh, keep your social distancing, wash your hands always, and uh, you know, wear a mask and do everything you can to, to try to help us and help your teammates uh, have a chance at a, at a season. So, but it, you're going to have to trust them. And uh, I think for the most part, the kids do a great job with this and, and they want to play. There's no question that they want to play. So we'll see how it goes. The other thing I, I, I would mention, Harris, the other part of this is the mental health issue of, of uh, young athletes and they want to compete. That's their, their whole world. They, that's what they do. They compete, they go to school, they, they do a good job in the classroom and they have an opportunity to compete on the playing fields and they want to do the best job that they can. They're very prideful young people and they want to, they want to do great work. And I, I worry about that a little bit. And, and we have all these institutions have people on board now that will, that, that are available to these uh, young people to ask questions of and to, to counsel with them and to try to help them through what is a very trying and challenging and difficult time. Uh, is there a point, and I, I don't know, I assume you've discussed this uh, internally and also with the conference, where a program, for instance, like the, the, the Marlins, they're, they're 11, 14 people involved with the team coming down with positive tests and they had to shut everything down now for an indefinite period of time with the schedule. Uh, is there a, a point where if you get X number of positive cases, uh, you have to rethink whether you should continue on? Well, we're gonna get great advice always from the doctors and the, uh, the training staff people. They're going to, to give us an indication of how serious this is and how we need to make a change or whatever it happens to be. So. There is a, a hierarchy here that is absolutely in place. Obviously, the doctors, the conference, the presidents of all these institutions and the, and the upper level administration. So we'll, we'll have plenty of people helping uh, to make the best decision possible. And, and again, it will involve the conference. It will involve the NCAA to an extent. It will involve the other conferences who are uh, trial a lot of this is they're trying so many different ways of of getting this done we're, we're watching what the pros are doing we're watching what baseball is doing we're watching the the bubble that hockey and, and basketball are in uh, we don't have that opportunity but you're certainly learning from others and but the doctors have been just unbelievable in terms of the time and effort they have spent in this they're they're on the phone constantly with all the coaches with all the administration uh, and throughout all these conferences. So I'm really impressed with all of that. Uh, and again, all under the, the guise of, of being healthy and safe. I have had the experience as the voice of Temple football and basketball to travel with teams and, and just the football, the logistics, most people don't under, realize what's involved. Uh, with a charter plane, for instance, for a road game, that may have 125, 130 people on it, 65 of whom are the, the maximum number of players allowed to go on a road game. And then you have uh, an additional uh, dozen or more assistant coaches, managers, trainers, uh, members of the athletic department, people like myself, Paul Palmer, the broadcast crew. Um, 
is it safe to say that once those charters get in the air again this year, they will hardly resemble what's been done in the past and the type of numbers that I was just talking about, just the logistics mm -hmm. of taking Temple football on the road. How and will it differ? Well, there'll be a lot less people uh, and all those people that will be on that plane. And the, the word that we're getting is it's probably safer uh, flying than it is basically in buses and those kinds of things. Uh, and you're also gonna see uh, mask on all, all these young people and everybody on the plane. I think everybody's going to, to have that as their, their mantra, wear that mask and, and make sure that they're being as safe as they possibly can be. And again, washing hands and socially distancing as much as you can. And, uh, so, but there'll be a lot less people on those planes. Right. And uh, I would assume even though basketball is uh, a little, a, a much different number uh, to travel party wise, you know, a third or less, uh, there'll be changes also when it comes to basketball. Very much so. And again, as you mentioned before, the, these things are changing every single day. So uh, it, right. it'll be interesting to see what will happen, when football will play, how many games will be played, if they will play, uh, what will happen with basketball? Will we play just league games in basketball? Will it happen after January 1? Who knows where we're headed in all of this? And uh, so it's, it, there's so many unknowns that we're just trying to deal with and just get through. But it, again, under that, under the thought of always being as healthy and as safe as we can be. Tommy, uh, as a player, you know, uh, you know, there's just so many hours in a day you spend at the stadium and then there's the downtime away from the field and, and the camaraderie hanging out with maybe one or two guys in particular a lot. Um, I'm sure that's missing right now among the players that are faced with this whole COVID experience. Yeah, I mean, uh, and that's a big thing, I think, with uh, – I know where I, when I grew up in the teams I played on, that was one of the huge things that made us, I think, so special. We kind of come together uh, to get uh, – uh, I know the one year we had our, our, our famous in 93, our year, well, that was one of the things that, that our team did so well. The clubhouse was there. We spent a lot of time together um, and, and around each other a lot. I mean, I'm talking arriving at the ballpark, you know, uh, at one o'clock and not leaving to two o'clock or three o'clock in the morning sometimes. I mean, it was like we'd never, uh, some of us, you know, I mean, we always had a group there uh, that did that. And that's kind of, and I miss those guys. They were my family. Um, and and these, these guys, they find a way to be around each other a little bit. Uh, but also we're more, I mean, we didn't have Zoom. We didn't have uh, computers like phones that, that where you could Snapchat and all, and all the social media that is around today where they can stay connected to each other when they're off the field or away from the ballpark, which, I think is, is a huge thing now that they're having to go through and distance from each other a little bit more, you know, but I, but that's one of the, one of the things about a, a team aspect is spinning and being able to be close and, and, and talk about ball games and, and after, after the games and events have happened, yeah. but, uh, but they got to stay safe that for him to be able to play, they got to do the right thing. It's like Fran said, they got to wear the mask. They got to social distance when they can. They got to do the right thing to try to do that for the, for the, to be able to play these games for the other person. They got to do that. Yeah, so much of this, uh, a team or a college can do so much uh, in terms of, you know, getting the information out there and, and urging uh, players to do the right thing when they're not under the control of a coach or whatever, a manager, but Ultimately, it comes down to a lot of personal responsibility. And I have a question here from someone who is uh, watching tonight. Uh, Chris Hansen's question is, given what we've all seen in terms of a less serious perspective being taken by younger adults, what message is being communicated to young athletes and what can be done to prevent the spread when these athletes are away from their teams and away from sports physicians. Brandy, you want to, I'm sure this has been uh, part of your job and part of the coaching staff uh, under you in the athletic department to continually harp on that message. 
Well, again, I, I think you trust in the student athlete, you trust in the coaches. Uh, I'll give you one example, Hara, of uh, we, we talked a little bit about once the kids get off the practice court, let's just say it's basketball and you, you have a two hour practice and the guys have, have uh, gone after each other for two hours. And the, what the culture is, is you go off to the sidelines, you grab water, you do whatever, and you sit around in a group and you shoot the breeze, uh, uh, not only about what happened in practice today, but what happens in life and, and how'd you do, what, what were some of the things that went on in your life? But you sit around and, and that camaraderie as Tommy was talking about is really critical on this. And the, the, you, the leaders of the team take over and, and uh, you, you cut up a little bit, you bust each other's chops a little, and, but that's part of the culture. And now you're, you're urged to tell those kids if they're, they're in that kind of setting, listen, you, you can't do that right now. You'll be able to do it in the near future, we hope. But right now you gotta get back to your dorm rooms, you gotta get a shower, get washed up, get, uh, get something to eat, and it's going to be a grab and go kind of thing. It's not like you're going to have six or eight guys sit around to a dining room table and, and shoot the breeze while you're eating dinner. You're going to grab a, a plastic container of food and go back to your room and, and do whatever you're going to do, study and, or play a video game or whatever the, the rest of your night's going to look like. But it's not going to be the same camaraderie. But uh, I have a lot of great faith in the young people and in young athletes. And I think they're going to do the right thing as much as they possibly can. Will somebody fall to the wayside, maybe, uh, but but hopefully they will they will understand that they're representing everybody uh, on that team, and they've got to do the right thing. I have a question from Ernest Hanna concerning testing, and Ernest asks: Given the shortage of testing supplies in the U.S., and I just want to add, uh, from my perspective, uh, testing supplies some are some areas of the country are doing a lot better than others, but anyhow. Ernest wants to know what rationale can he use to justify the amount of testing supplies and resources devoted to professional sports instead of essential workers or disadvantaged communities? Uh, the, the question of, first of all, are professional sports and athletes taking advantage of uh, the opportunity to be tested more frequently than other people? Not many people are getting tested as frequently, but I guess it also applies to college athletes as well. Tell me, from, from your perspective, um, is this a major problem? Do you think? I, I mean, it's. I mean, I'm not in. And like, like Fran, he, he's the AD and sees how this, the testing and stuff are going on with the athletes that he deals with at his school. Um, uh, but the question in itself does hit home. Um, uh, or to me, he's asking or the athletes or the sports more important than the rest of us. That's sort of what i um, sort of heard a little bit. Why shouldn't it be? We have access to that red list, the immediate access to that red list uh, than uh, the, the, the athlete. Uh, and that, I mean, to me, it's a good question. Um, and I don't like to look at it like that. I like to look at it that our athletes are going to surprise uh, uh, and then our football and our basketball, our hockey, our golf, is going to supply the nation with a little bit of a breath of fresh air that they're able to see something that they really enjoy happen, happen and important to be able to do that. We got to test our guys. We got to have them tested. So there's going to have to be a give and take there. You know? uh, a question from Jim Larkin uh, to Fran. Just wondering, Jim says, if classes are virtual, or most of them will be, I guess, uh, how can a team practice or how can games be played? Uh, Brandy, what's the explanation on that? Well, the, the times of the classes will all be the same during the day. And then the practices will take place after, uh, after the school day is over and completed. Uh, so I, I, I don't, I'm not sure I understand the, the question. Uh, and maybe James wanted to, to ask it, but. Uh, yeah, I, I guess what he was trying to say, uh, unlike cl no classes at all, at least the classes are being held uh, virtually. Mm -hmm. And uh, if that's the case, it's not like school is not in session, right? And therefore, they're not playing football with nobody else involved in any uh, classwork at all. They're involved in classwork, as are students who are not football players or non-athletes albeit virtually. 
correct? Yeah, the kids will be on the computer all day long uh, for, for the most part. Not only will they uh, take their classes virtually when they have it, but hopefully they'll have as much as 25 or 30% in-person classes as well that they can go to. Hopefully they'll have the, a, a good blend of that. Uh, but they'll also uh, get their their academic advisors will be on the on the on the uh, on the Zoom as well. So it's that's what college life is is right now, and that's what that's what happened in the second semester, the spring semester as well. So uh, everybody understood what the the rules of the game were, and I thought the professors did a great job in in taking that responsibility on and getting to as many kids as possible, as and being available as they, as much as they possibly could. So. Uh, I, I do have faith in the in the university system in that regard that they won't miss uh, very much at all. As a matter of fact, they may get they may get even more attention paid to them because of the Zoom. But uh, but it's not the same. I, I, on a personal note, I would love to uh, have it be just in person classes because you get the emotions that are in there and you get people raising their hand and and uh, you learn. And the reality is, you learn from others as much as you learn from uh, the professors in the classroom. And so. It's uh, that that's being we're being a little bit compromised by that. You know, Tommy, we, we uh, talked earlier a little bit. Uh, I think Graham mentioned about not knowing how many people would be in attendance uh, for Temple games. What's I can't imagine uh, <laughs> as a, you as a former player when you watch a game and you see these cardboard cutouts in the seats and you know noises. Um, they even have, you know, Dan Baker introducing the players and there's nobody there to cheer and they yeah. have faux cheer noises. I mean, playing in front of an empty state, when's the last time you ever played in front of an empty stadium, if ever in your life? My closest one was probably up in Montreal when I threw the no hitter. I didn't have an 8,000 there. <laughs> but uh, right. yeah, I've, 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 I've had this question asked to me a right good bit. Um, and being a pitcher and, and, and to be able to get to uh, get to where I got to up in the big leagues, and, I'm, I'm, and it's pretty, pretty, I think it's pretty good for all major athletes to get to the highest level. Uh, you've got to have a mentality where the game's played right there in front of you. I know my game was 60 foot six inches away from me. It wasn't out up here hearing or seeing the fans and whatever they do. Yes, do I do do I hear them? I hear them more when I get the last out than I do when I'm out there pitching. Um, but to answer your question, there's been a lot of stadiums that I played in the minor leagues where you're pitching in front of 20 people, you know, and, and a ball and in the middle of the, the mountains somewhere in West Virginia, you're playing somewhere, you might get 20 people out there one night. And I mean, but it's about competing and playing the game. And, and being prideful in yourself and you're and uh, still you're out there working for uh, you're working for and playing for for a purpose. Uh, first of all, is the love of the game and how to play it the right way. And then you're trying to make a living for your family and, and to move forward and, uh, and, and, and do that. So the guys, are, uh, they'll be OK with that. But it's still awful weird not seeing fans in the stands. And, and hearing those noises and stuff like that. It's, but uh, those, those guys are going to do a pretty good job. At it. I have a question here from Kara Olenzak uh, for Fran. And her question is, would uh, Temple consider housing fall athletes together in say a couple of dorms under a quarantine similar to the NBA bubble program and perhaps managing meals practices and online classes. Um, are, 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 have there been changes made, Fran, uh, compared to a normal year, a normal season, in terms of how the athletes, where they live and who they live with, or uh, have you gone into a really a, a bubble like the, the NBA uh, for housing and, and things like that, meals, et cetera? Yeah, I think you'd be amazed at the amount of protocols that are in place here. And, uh, and to the question of, uh, there are many of those ideas that, that uh, what was the young lady's name? Uh, Kara. Kara, I, I think Kara had suggested a number of those and I think they are in place. And uh, the, the return to return to campus committee, take, taking all of those things into consideration, all the doctoring, 
that's going on at Temple University now, as well as all these universities throughout Philadelphia and the country. Uh, there are so many protocols that are going on. And, and uh, again, they're, they're, the most important thing is to keeping these young people healthy and safe. And, and uh, again, I have great faith and trust that uh, they're doing a great job with it. But as we talked about so much, it's so much is on the, on the uh, heads of the uh, student athletes and the, and the students themselves and making sure that they are being, uh, paying attention to all the details that, that are asked of them with, uh, again, the masks, and social distancing, and those kinds of things. And, but there are many protocols that are already in place for such, uh, as Kara was mentioning. I know you can only speak for, for Temple University, but uh, how much input did, if any, uh, did, did the athletes have, in this case, say football, but also some of the other ball sports competitors, athletes, student athletes, did, did you meet with them? Uh, did the coaching staff meet with them and go over some of these protocols and, and see what, uh, what was on the minds of the, of the student athletes? Yeah, very much so. I think that's, that's the first thing uh, every coach will do was meet with his, his team over Zoom. And uh, it's amazing how many great ideas will come out of those uh, young minds and because uh, they get it. They absolutely get it. They're smart. They're understanding of what's, uh, what the uh, compromises are and they totally understand. So yeah, they were, they were talked to and with uh, constantly and uh, everybody trying to get their opinions on what, what might be a good idea and how they're feeling. You know, I, I can remember I, I was teaching a class in the spring and uh, we had, we went from uh, in-person class to online class. And we spent the, the first two classes, almost uh, two hours a piece, uh, just talking about how they felt, what they were going through, what are some of the, the things that were on their mind. And uh, that's the most important thing is to get their feelings understood. And, and that's what I was saying to you before about the, the mental health piece to this. It's so critical and so important and in such a, an important time of all of their lives. And uh, you want what's best for them and in every sense of the word, whether it's on the uh, mental health uh, portion of it or it's the, uh, the physical health and staying uh, COVID free as much as we can possibly be. And so that's always in the forefront of our minds. This question, Fran, is from Alexander Bond. And he says, is Temple planning on rescinding or otherwise halting athletic scholarships? Never heard that mentioned one time in the last couple of months. No one's ever talked about that. All right, okay. Uh, another question, and this goes both for Tommy and, and Fran. What impact has the virus had uh, on ath athlete conditioning, uh, training programs, I guess, uh, since March when we first found out about this and everything shut down and, and moving forward from March? I mean, initially, Tommy, um, were you in touch with any athletes uh, and, and they were wondering, gee, what, what can I, can I do and things like that? And, and how has it affected their preparation for this season? Do you know? Well, I mean, it, it, it's sort of with baseball, it's like you saw, they had two spring trainings. Uh, so before you get to spring training, you're trying to be, uh, I know when I was coming up, you didn't come in spring training to get in shape. You come in spring training in shape, the best shape you could be in to try to earn a job to get where you, uh, to, to stick with that big club. Uh, and uh, I think guys go about their preparation, especially these days. They're, I mean, they're in pretty good shape coming in. I mean, and, and they know about uh, what makes them tick to get that way. And they're in constant contact, you know, through Zoom and through uh, with the athletic trainers and, and the strength and, and condition coaches uh, to try to, to stay on their program and the pitching coaches to find once they have started throwing like that, how to maintain so and then what they need to do a little bit on a on a routine basis um, to have them more likely to be able to handle the the preparation they had this second time to get ready quickly, uh, a little more quicker. Uh, they needed to be in shape. I know it personally, it, nothing prepares you for games other than games. Uh, the adrenaline gets flowing a little bit more. You start going a little bit. You stretch out a little bit. So I, I was questioning, you know, the health of some of these guys. Um, uh, maybe coming back, trying to get ready quick. 
Um, and I was praying for good health for these guys because that's a huge thing. Uh, and because if you ain't got your health, it's hard to compete. Uh, uh, but I think they've done a real, real good job at it uh, of doing that to getting back on the field like that. And and but judging by the way they're throwing and hitting and doing, th- I mean, uh, it's a pretty good job what they did. Fran, nothing is more important. I don't, well, I shouldn't say nothing, but nothing has certainly taken have a more impact in recent years in strength and conditioning for all college athletes. And uh, how available um, did the strength and conditioning rooms become for Chapel athletes, or were they basically off limits uh, up until now that you have the football players back? Yeah, the strength and conditioning was probably compromised a little bit in that you couldn't go to gyms, you couldn't work out uh, on your own. But what they did was be in touch with the strength and conditioning coaches always over Zoom, and I'm sure that they were talking with one another always, and and uh, they probably went back to their old uh, weight racks uh, back home in their basement, probably more than they ever had before, but uh, and got creative with it and probably ran some miles and ran some sprints and did all that. Uh, did all those things with the strength and conditioning folks. Uh, I, I do think that the skill level uh, piece to it was probably compromised even more in that uh, there were no gyms that were available and the gyms were sort of all on lockdown as well. So getting the opportunity to work at your individual dribbling, ball handling, those kinds of things were one thing. But as Tommy suggested, there's nothing that prepares you quite like playing games. And But there wasn't a lot of games to be played. There was uh, Everybody was worried about it. And, uh, you weren't going to, again, do anything foolish to put yourself in a difficult situation. So, but, uh, but I do think the kids will, will figure it out and uh, the coaches will figure it out. And uh, there'll be, there'll be opportunities to, for these young people to get better. And they probably watched a lot more film than they ever have before and, and studied some of, some of their own films, but studied some of the, in the basketball sense, a lot of the NBA games and, and watched and, and saw uh, things of uh, maybe some of the game film from last year as well on their own team and studied that even more than they ever would have uh, had it been a uh, non-COVID situation. So, but the strength and conditioning is one thing, the skill level is, a, is quite another as well. So I, I think th- they've done as good a job as they possibly could given the circumstances. You know, um, the question was asked earlier uh, in terms of put, keeping things in perspective. And, you know, we're getting near the end time here for our little panel discussion. And I want to thank both Tommy and, and Fran and, and Dr. Gary, who had to leave us early for uh, participating tonight. But just to summarize a little bit, uh, each of you, Tommy, I'll go with you first. How, and I think you touched on it earlier, how important to you is the resumption of sports? Uh, it'll never be quite normal as it has been in the past. But uh, are you really pulling for this thing to work from your perspective as a former player? Well, I am. I mean, I, I couldn't have been any more excited to see uh, sports back on, on, on TV, to see baseball played, to see golf played, and, and now seeing the hockey starting to, to go, and now we're looking for the NBA to finish. There's, I mean, I know from, from, from inside my home um, – uh, my, my children, just, I mean, they're, they're living and dying, waiting to wait for the hockey and stuff coming. You can see the excitement uh, in the youth, you know, and that's what, I mean, that's what's missing, I think, out there a little bit. And I mean, is to get exciting. And uh, with all this stuff happening, you know, I'm so glad, you know, that these sports are, are doing what they can to bring the product to, to, to the field. And I'm hoping that we can figure you know, or, or keep things in check enough that base uh, on the base MLB side as to not let this thing uh, hopefully get out of hand that where we have to cancel a lot of stuff. And you've seen how it's had to, how it's affected over the past week. I'm just hoping we can curtail it like they're trying to do and make that adjustment. And I think that's what we're going to have to do for the rest of the season. Yeah, there is a, a very fine line uh, when it comes to a, a go or no go. Fran, and in the final minute here, uh, just your own perspective. Now, as an athletic administrator, not just worrying about one sport, but worrying about uh, more than a dozen, uh, what's it like for you? Well, again, I have such great respect for all the coaches that run their programs and how they run them and how, how 
concerned they are with their, their athletes. And uh, certainly I'm excited by the fact that we have a chance, but, but not uh, compromising the health and safety of these young people. We, that's gotta be foremost in our minds. And we've talked about that throughout the, uh, the, the Zoom tonight. The, the thing I do worry about is the socialization piece that, uh, that is so important about going to, to a university setting and, and college life is so important that way. And again, to learn from your fellow students and we're, we don't have that opportunity like we, we did when we were COVID free here. So it, it's changed our lives. In some ways it's, it's been better because we've appreciated what life has given, what, all the good things we have about life. And, uh, so we, we probably connected with our family more than we've ever had in the, in the past. And so some of this stuff has been really great, but the socialization piece is really important. And, uh, and I'm just hoping that we can get the, that the, uh, we have so many smart people and so many great doctors out there. I'm hoping that we'll get that uh, vaccine soon and we will be on our way to resuming life as it, as it was before, while it will change dramatically. Uh, the socialization piece is so important. Gary. Fran Duffy, thank you, and uh, Tommy okay. Green, and thank you. Dr. Gary Dorsheimer. Even though he's absent right now, we want to pass along our thanks for him, too, for joining us. John Miko, it's your time. Harry, thank you so much. Tommy, Fran, uh, what, a, what a great uh, talk. We, we appreciate your time uh, and for all that you do. Fran, good luck. I could not agree with you more. I think the, the consequences of the shutdown are, are not really appreciated. And I, I think that uh, one of the things we need to do is get back to some some kind of normal for all of our our, our uh, you know mental health and everything else. And let's hope it happens and happens safely. And again, gentlemen, uh, thank you so much. Appreciate it on behalf of the Legacy Foundation. Appreciate your uh, your support and your time tonight. Thanks. Got it. Thanks for having me. Take it easy. So. Uh, what a great program we have other uh, series of programs over the next couple of weeks. Um, we have uh, on, uh, excuse me, August 20th, Charlie Duff is going to be talking about row homes as classical architecture in a library hour. And on September 2nd, we hope to hear some good news from Alex Gorski. Alex Gorski is the CEO of Johnson & Johnson uh, and a league member, and he's going to be uh, joining us for a public affairs program. We're also in process of scheduling at least one other program. We're hoping it's going to be on August 18th because August 18th is the 100th anniversary of the passage uh, of the 19th Amendment, a ratification of the 19th Amendment. And um, so we are hoping to do a program on the 19th Amendment, which of course uh, is women's suffrage. And that will coincide with uh, the development of our next exhibit, which is on voting rights, which will open uh, at the end of September. So we look forward to seeing you on uh, August 20th and have a wonderful evening. Good night.